I would like to invite to the stage one of the boldest, most adept international business leaders I've come to know, uh, and somebody that I like very much, Antoni Strianesi, CEO of Gorilla Japan. Thank you. Thank you. I need a mic. You do need a mic. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. A little bit exaggerated, but uh, I don't think I said enough. Uh, you know, Anthony. Be before we get into uh, your business, uh, what is it that prompted you to come to Japan? Um, well, <clears throat> it's a very personal reason, I would say. When I was a kid, I was uh, doing judo for many, many years, and uh, and for me, you know, Japan was a uh, Jigoro Kano homeland and uh, the place to be. Um, and then actually, uh, I mean, it's a little bit of a joke, but uh, before coming to uh, Tokyo, um, I was uh, based in Singapore and uh, looking at the, overlooking at the market uh, for Asia and Australia, Africa, and I really mm, was inspired by the challenges that uh, this market uh, would have offered to to managers like me. Uh, it seemed to be a market impossible to crack to everyone. And uh, I mean, normally those are the type of challenges where I, where I have fun. So, so that's how I so ended up. Specifically, Im impossible to crack. What seemed like it was the biggest challenge to you in Japan? Um, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I rely a lot on, um, on uh, networking and uh, all my friends. So. In the beginning of my career, I worked for other multinational companies. Uh, so the first thing I did was calling, uh, you know, those uh, old friends in L'Oreal or Racket Benkiser, and everybody was telling me, no, no, you know, you don't don't go to Japan. You know, our company failed there, and you're gonna destroy your career. You, you, know. you know, this is on the record, right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so. <clears throat> um, but you know, still, I thought that uh, there were few companies that uh, made it, and uh, you know, I always like to look at uh, who 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 managed to crack it rather than uh, benchmark myself against the failures. Um, and so, you know, then I worked for Barilla. I think we will talk a little bit uh, about that. It's a family-owned company. Uh, we take things very seriously uh, in the sense that for us, everything is uh, is a family deal. Um, and I feel that I had the right support to, to make it happen. When, now, when you took over the role of uh, CEO of Barilla Japan, uh, about when was that? Um, officially three, three years ago. It was more or less uh, October, November of uh, three years ago, although I moved uh, in Japan in uh, April the following year. So. Okay. okay, so you were officially in the role. Yeah. Uh, but you didn't move until about April the following year. Yeah. So that would be uh, 2015, approximately? Yeah, yeah, two and a half years ago. Yeah. Okay. Um, and when you arrived, what is it that struck you the most about Japan and about uh, the business that you had here? Well, the first thing was the most obvious, I guess, uh, the fact that um, our company, uh, in Japan, is 100% about pasta, but uh, on a global level, we are actually 50% a pasta sauce company and 50% a bakery company. Um, but what was uh, shocking at the time was that Japan is the sixth largest pasta market of the world, and uh, and basically we were nothing. And um, and I could figure out why was like that, having Barilla being in the market for over 35 years at the time. Um, so generally, in, in other markets in the world, what, what's your penetration? Uh, no, I mean, we have a decent uh, uh, share, mostly everywhere, in, uh, in the top pasta market. Uh -huh. Normally, we are uh, number one in Italy, in US, right. or, um, or France. Uh, and, or even, you know, if we are not number one, normally we are head-to-head -head with the local, uh, uh, local leaders. So um, being Japan such a quality 
oriented uh, um, market, it, it, it was surprising at least to see that uh, our brand was not yet able to deliver the values to, to this market. So if I can ask you, um, when you arrived in Barilla, Japan, uh, what did you think of the business in terms of how it was running, its relationship with distributors? Well, the first thing was that, of course, I didn't know anything about Japan, absolutely nothing of the business culture here. And, um, and of course, I think that the first impression that every gaijin uh, manager gets when arrives in Japan is that here everything is wrong or something doesn't work. Um, so I couldn't really figure out which were the uh, processes at the base of, uh, of our organization. Like, you know, I couldn't understand why my staff was spending, you know, their time in doing activities that I couldn't imagine how functional to the business could be. Or, um, or even the fact that um, compared to any other country, uh, relation, building relations was so important and, uh, and people were spending so much time in, in you know, entertaining uh, customers or, um, or, uh, or building uh, strong relations with them. Uh, and then, you know, I think that the, the, the following uh, months were basically just dedicated to, to really observe the situation. Uh, the first choice I think I made was to uh, not to, to change everything for the sake of it. So I remember spending the first months of my experience in Japan just uh, talking to people, learning, trying to understand uh, how really the business uh, worked in Japan and, and try to make up my own idea on how to make things work. So, so in that initial period, as you were observing, uh, what are some of the top observations that you made and top conclusions that you came to? Um, well, there are quite a few. So, um, first of all, is um, um, I don't know if starting from the, the top of the bottom of it, but so the essence is that my belief <coughs> became clear that um, Japan was not really different from any other countries, at least for what in regards to the type of work that uh, we were supposed to do or. Uh, or, uh, or a brand in Japan is supposed to do. So at the end, you know, what matters for the market is always the same, like everywhere in the market. So a level of service, quality of product, respectful relations, and, uh, and honest relation with the business partners. So that was the essence of it. But I also recognize the fact that in, uh, in certain terms, Japan is unique. And, um, and you know, you have to respect the diversity of, uh, of, uh, of the culture and the diversity of the, of, the, of the people and the way of working in this country. So the effort I had to make, I had to make at the time was really to, uh, to really select carefully which were the uh, elements that uh, I could not change of this culture. Uh, that they were working in Japan in their own way and that was the right way of doing things and coupling those elements with the element of change that I wanted to bring in the country. So what, what did you want to change? Um, yeah, I think we discussed this off the la off, off line uh, a few days ago. Um, I have a personal management style, which I believe is not unique, is common to, to many other people, which is being extremely open, direct, honest, uh, and transparent and uh, and I truly believe that when you are able to you know to be like that even in Japan um, those things you know the business would would come after so you know there is a famous book that says you know the results will take care of itself um, I firmly believe in that <clears throat> and the first impression of Japan at least to my eyes maybe was filtered a little bit by my old organization or, or the partners uh, I was working with is that there was not complete transparency in the way we were working. So for me, it was impossible to understand the really the KPIs of my business. It was impossible to understand to which customer we were selling, how much we were selling, and uh, you know if we had taken some agreements or not. And so being 
disconnected from uh, uh, from the market was really something that I could not accept. Well, th these are really fundamental things you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, which customers do we have relationships with? How much are we selling? What are the agreements that we have with our customers? And that was not transparent to you? No, there was a way of running, um, running the business that um, that was uh, uh, controlled, let's say, completely uh, by by our partners uh, partners in Japan, and um, you know, I d again, you know, I didn't want to necessarily change everything I found in Japan, but I was really looking to have access to this information and to bring a contribution to the uh, to the development of our company in Japan. Now, let me make sure that I understand this correctly. Uh, you you had a, a distributor relationship in Japan, um, and they had information on all these things, but it was not transparent to you. So mostly what you were doing is you were just keeping them supplied with what they asked for? Yeah, we were we were providing only a limited uh, number of services that we could. So basically, what we were doing were um, was um, providing the products, of course, delivering on time, and uh, uh, whenever was requested, we were uh, participating in entertaining customers or building relation with the customers. Um, but of course, I feel that uh, you know all all our, all companies have much more. Uh, uh, to bring to this market, and uh, we could possibly enjoy of sharing those those different elements of our business culture. And that time, that was not uh, not really possible. So that was the main area where I tried to uh, to focus to start, you know, bringing a little bit of change. Okay. So, so without this type of access, this type of visibility, it makes it very hard to first control your business, second improve it and maybe third, to help your distributor do better based on what you know from uh, doing this type of business around the world. Correct, you know, and uh, <clears throat> there are uh, some friends here uh, into, through the guests and many of them are also distributors and, and uh, this is something that I really want to, to make uh, clear as well. Um, there is nothing wrong into having a partner or a distributor partner. Uh, and I think that this is still a model that uh, in many circumstances is extremely valid in Japan and companies should seek um, these strategies to develop their brands. I go back to my original point, provided that the relation is fully uh, of partnership uh, based on uh, honest, honest uh, share, uh, sharing of information and uh, transparency of, uh, of, uh, of relations. So that's, uh, that's what I believe. Uh. So, so based on these observations, um, what did you decide to do? Uh, well, again, uh, the first thing I tried to do in respect also of the long-standing relation we had with, um, with this business partner was to try to work with them. Um, so uh, with a little bit of naive approach, uh, not considering that you know I was uh, 35 years old at the time, 36, and you know my counterpart would have been a, ma a respectful Japanese gentleman over the 70s. You know I thought that I could speak uh, directly to this person and try to explain um, to them or to him what I wanted to do. When, when you say your counterpart, you're talking about the CEO of the distributor company? Yes, even if at the very beginning that was not like that, because <clears throat> well, uh, of course, um, again, you know, it's Japan, we, we respect the way things work here, but I was not considered at the same level of the CEO of my uh, counterpart company. So of course, the CEO of my counterpart company would only speak with the owner of my company uh, as a parity type of relation. And I had to talk with people that I, unfortunately I then realized that were not the real decision makers. Uh, and that actually all the effort I was putting in trying to honestly, openly, and transparently uh, changing the business was not really bringing anywhere because uh, those people were not able to, to really transfer uh, the, the, the intensity or the strength of the changes I wanted to, I wanted to bring. So they, they were really intermediaries, um, but effectively they were gatekeepers. 
uh, again, I think they were playing their role within this uh, uh, typical Japanese um, Japanese structure, uh, which is um, something that I still find in uh, in other. Uh, business relation in Japan, which was trying to maintain a certain stability, a status quo, on how the things uh, would work. Um, so obviously I was seen as, a, as a, a too much of an agent, uh, changing agent, that you know they were not expecting to come. Uh, and probably at the same time they were also thinking that um, you know, I was just another one coming in, you know, like uh, many of us, uh, again, Gaijin managers comes in and, you know, they shout for two, three years and then, you know, at the end they, they leave the country and, uh, and that's it, you know, we start all over again. So they can outlast you, basically? F fundamentally, yes. Okay. Um, and, and you were not viewed on par with the CEO, um, even, even though, if I understand correctly, the, the distributor contract that you had was signed by both you and, and him. Yeah, but, you know, to be honest, I don't want to put that uh, in that way. I think that that was simply the, the way uh, the business was organized before I came in. So there were the established counterpart of the business, which could have worked in the previous situation of, you know, stability and no change. Uh, but in the moment that uh, uh, I decided that I wanted to bring a, a dramatic change, uh, they were not anymore the, the right counterparts for me. Um, so I was trying to seek you know, the right counterparts in, uh, in the company, but eventually I realized that uh, it was not a matter really of uh, you know, who I was talking to, but was really a not uh, common uh, uh, vision on where the company should have been in the next years. Right, and, and ultimately you came to that conclusion. Um, but what, 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 did you, what did you do? The, the steps, again, those steps go back to the way I deal with the business. So um, I remember the first uh, months um, spending time with them, trying to develop together a, a, a strategy that... Uh, when, when you say, say them, you're talking about the intermediaries that you were Yes, with. yes. Uh, trying to develop a strategy that could work in Japan and uh, make our brand, uh, our brand growth. But the problem is that, um, I mean, everyone is responsible of his own destiny. And, um, and of course, in the, in the business structure that we had at the moment, our destiny is, was actually controlled by them right. and, um, and and so I honestly I don't think that there is from their point of view they did anything wrong because I mean they were also sitting on a situation that was unchanged for over 30 years um, uh, thinking that what the way of the head of running the business was correct and uh, and probably that we would have um, better continued in the same way um, so it was, it was working for them, but it wasn't working for you? Uh, correct, or at least we didn't have the same expectations we, we had for the future. You know, the role that I see for, um, uh, for Barilla in the future is, um, is a little bit broader than simply selling products to this country. I think that Japan is a fantastic uh, country that uh, we're lucky, I mean, loves a lot Italian culture and uh, uh, our image as a country and as a um, manufacturers is extremely high compared to, uh, to maybe other countries. And it's a great opportunity for, uh, for um, my company as well as many other companies to, to really sell the full set of values that we, that we bring together. So um, I wanted to develop something more than delivering products. And, and we're going to get into that mm -hmm. a little bit later. But um, uh, after making no progress, with uh, the people that you were dealing with inside the company, what did you do? Um, I think that there is a changing moment, precise uh, day, a precise second when uh, this happened. Um, and that was when I, mm, I was really stressed. I mean, I was even questioning whether, uh, whether I was good for the job or even whether you know, coming to Japan at all was, uh, was a good decision. So, 
uh, I think I was really at the turning point on whether I should quit and leave and uh, give up or, or I had to make a dramatic change. And that dramatic change happened one day when uh, following also uh, someone uh, push and advice, um, I went directly to the top and I, and that was really bad. I mean, I remember the consequences of that day when I picked up the phone. You're not saying my advice was bad, right? No, <laughs> I, w I will get to the bad advice. <laughs> I picked up the phone and I called directly this uh, Mr. President to meet him. And uh, 10 seconds later, I started to get, you know, phones from his office saying, you know, what the hell are you doing? You know, why are you calling our boss? And we didn't know anything, etc. Uh, but as a matter of fact, then the Japan style, uh, which is beautiful, came in and uh, the CEO met me and we had this um, extremely open conversation. Uh, but that was fundamental because finally I, I understood what was the, the vision that that company had of our business and how they, they, they would have pictured the development of the company for the following years. And, um, and sadly enough, I can say that was uh, so clearly 100% against the way we uh, were looking at the business and the way of developing. But I never had the chance to speak so frankly and so openly um, uh, about that. So that, that gave me the elements to, uh, to do everything else. I mean, they gave me the elements of, um, you know, to, to, to speak to my management in a different way, uh, you know, to shift the organization then in a different shape, the organization in a different way, and really kicked in the process that brought us where we are, uh, where we are now. So, so after that and meeting with this, the CEO of the distributor company, you knew exactly where you stood. You, you had communicated your intentions, he had communi communicated his. Um, if, if, you don't, if, if you don't mind, uh, can you kind of set the scene and, and talk a bit about how that whole conversation went? Um. <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's tricky because I don't want to be misunderstood, but I think that um, picturing the scene, the scene helps because um, probably some of us or some of you or, uh, you know, could, could f one day experience that type of situation. So I think that there was a complex of some elements that sometimes can be found in the Japanese business culture, but they are not common. And I don't recognize these as... Uh, typical traits of the Japanese business culture. Like, so, like what? Well, I mean, of course, the age played a big role. So I was the, uh, you know, the little kid uh, facing, um, uh, uh, facing the super senior guy that had uh, obviously probably three times my accumulated experience in, uh, in business. Um, and of course, you know, there was no point of mentioning that I had seen uh, my company or the pasta business growing in a certain way in 20 other different countries uh, because I mean at the end the expert of Japan was him um, so I felt really the the fact that I was talking but he was not listening and he would take the opportunity to to tell me you know to teach me a lesson on how to run the business in uh, in Japan um, now, you Unfortunately, were doing this all through a translator, right? Yeah, that's, that's the other point. Unfortunately, I could not even grasp the intensity of the messages I was receiving because um, the conversation was in Japanese through a translator. And unfortunately, I made a small mistake, very small, which was bring someone of my team uh, that was good in English and Japanese, of course, but not uh, a professional translator. So. Uh, I could actually see the reality of the talking through the expression on her face and uh, how red she was becoming rather than exactly what was translated to me. So I kind of thought that probably what was translated to me was a little bit more gentle and, uh, and uh, cleaned up than what uh, was actually said during the meeting. So, um, so he was quite angry with you, would you say that? Yeah, but, but I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, I. I didn't take it personally, first sure. of all. Uh, I thought that he was talking from a legitimate position of being the CEO of his company. By the way, pretty successful, so sure. uh, chapeau, and I had nothing to say. So 
um, I was just listening and uh, and uh, gathering information to build up my own story. And um, and after that conversation, again, I didn't took it personally. I feel I actually felt extremely relieved because um, I f I came to the conclusion that. Uh, it was a very simple business story, like, you know, you have different strategies, as very often happens in the market. And, uh, and when you have different strategies and a different vision on how to execute the strategies, it's simple, it's just a relation that cannot work anymore. Okay, so at, the, at that point you knew exactly where you stood, you knew what they wanted, you knew what you wanted. Uh, what did you decide to do from there? That, and I want to say that this was probably 12 months uh, since I was in Japan. And until that moment of time, I didn't even consider for one second to quit the relation. Uh, which means that, you know, to all my distributor friends here, uh, I was still thinking that uh, it was possible to build a profitable, sustainable, growing business with a Japanese partner in, in the former way of running the business. Uh, but after that day, I had to, you know, come up with a plan B, and uh, because I always do like that, with a plan C and a plan D as well. Um, and so we started to, you know, to work with my with my team on on the options we had in the market, uh, in you know, having in in mind the long term vision that we had for uh, for our company, and we worked backwards. I think that one of the elements that is fundamental when a company goes through a process of higher or smaller intensity compared to what we did is that it's very crucial that you set your vision in the very beginning you know and personally you know on a very basic way it was written on write this uh, red uh, notebook here <laughs> and um, and from time to time you go back and read what you wanted to to do because then it's tough. I mean, there are some moments where uh, there are too many difficulties, it seems impossible, and you're stuck into details uh, of every sort. You know, we, can decom we could decompose my business in millions of fractions, and in every single of them we had issues. Uh, but it is always fundamental to go back to what you want to do, your vision, your long-term objective, and try to refine you know, the, the route and the right direction towards that. So, so going back after this conversation with the CEO, you knew that the, the way forward was not gonna be with them. Uh, but you put down what your vision for the company was, what you wanted it to be, and then you worked backwards from that, as opposed to looking at what you had in terms of relationships, customers, assets in Japan, and building up forward. Yes, but again, I think you have to be a little bit naive on that uh, because when I asked uh, to my team and to my business partners at the time uh, what's going to happen if I start my own uh, uh, venture in Japan, uh, I mean, the, the picture was quite catastrophic uh, in the sense that, you know, in their mind, I would have, you know, we would have lost completely the business. Most probably customers would have not uh, bought our products. Um, and uh, you know our image in the country would would have been destroyed completely, uh, and there was no chance of survival after the decision. Um, again, you know, very simple approach. I went back to what I want to do, and what are my values. So I was thinking that you know if you would face the market with a clear vision and um, very open approach. Japan could not be really different from any other market. At the end, I mean, this is the third largest economy in the world, plenty of multinational companies that uh, successfully deal with uh, the rest of the planet, so I couldn't believe that the other way around could not work, of bringing an international company in Japan and make things happen. Uh, uh, but I have to tell you that I was pretty much alone in that vision, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and I, I felt what? <laughs> quite isolated for, uh, for quite a few weeks. It is lonely at the top. I can tell you that for sure. Um, so, so your staff thought that this was the death knell yep. to some degree. And when you, when you say, you know, as you looked at the, the type of company that you wanted to build uh, and the way you wanted to move forward, uh, it sounds like you weren't just looking for another distributor to replicate the structure that you had. You were looking at, when, when you say venture, you were talking about going directly to 
customers like large retailers, etc. Uh, I think I touched already two of uh, the key points of this more or less significant change in Japan. I mean, one is definitely sticking to the long-term uh, long-term vision. Um, the second was, you know, is planning and having a strategy on how to execute them. And uh, and the third one, I think, uh, we get to the probably the most the second most important for me after having the long-term vision, which is the type of environment that you want to create around you okay so you mean in, inside the company I, I, yeah I think mainly inside the company but this has been has to be something that your Japanese business partner needs to embrace as well right so they're part of your culture absolutely because otherwise I don't think that uh, it can work you know Japan uh, one of the special beautiful things about the business culture in Japan is that and uh, you know I was discussing with uh, with Thomas now uh, is that once you gain the trust of your customer, this trust is going to stay with you forever, most likely, unless you, <laughs> you don't mess up uh, dramatically on something. So what I wanted to share inside and outside the company was the base values of what I was going to build, which were based on um, a growth mindset, um, a, um, empowerment. Um, and by empowerment, style. What, what do you mean? I mean entrepreneurship, I mean um, trust in people, uh, um, risk I mean taking. risk taking, of course, which they all fall you know, in, in a group logic under the fact that once you share the same vision, people, business partners, suppliers, they have to be integrated in this vision. Um, I wanted to build, you know, maybe it's again a naive approach, but you know, we have a family company. I wanted to build a family set of business partners uh, inside, outside the company that could share this long-term vision. Just because something is simple doesn't mean it's naive. Fine, uh, fair enough. I still, uh, I think it's more romantic to think that I'm a little bit naive yet. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Pan approach. <laughs> So, so here you are, um, your, your staff doesn't share this vision with you. In fact, uh, they're, they're predicting utter disaster. Uh, so how did you handle that with your staff? Uh, well, I mean, not all the stories can be 100% happy. So of course, you know, dealing with first with the internal organization was not, uh, uh, was not easy. Um, so I mean, as a as a result. So let me tell the end of the story, but then I will go through that. So as a result, uh, after two years of being in Japan, I basically now have uh, a completely new uh, team in place um, that shares with me uh, the values and what I'm saying. But before getting to to that, the present and the future, I want to spend a few words on the past. So. Uh, it hap something very special, I think, it happened. So, first of all, um, the employees uh, we had in Barilla Japan before, they were all long-time employee. So, um, very loyal staff that uh, has been with us for, you know, some of them for 10, 15 years even. Um, and they really, in, in a certain way, embodied some of the values of the company. Uh, you know, it's, it's crazy, but you know, some of you know, uh, the Barilla guys, the Barilla family, they own 100% of the company, they come here uh, two, three times every year, and you know, we go all together out for dinner, it's, it's really a family, uh, family thing. Um, so when I, I, I clearly remember this, I had seven people at the time, so the day that I said, you know, guys, we're going to change, that's what we, I want to do, uh, blah, blah, blah. The morning after, two people resigned. Uh, she, they came directly to my office and said, Anthony, you know, we, we see what you want to do. Uh, we see that this is necessarily for the company. Uh, we have been waiting for this day for, you know, 10 years. Uh, but we're not able to help you in this venture. Uh, thank you very much. Good luck. And, and they left the company. I'm serious. This is not a joke. Did they tell you why? Yes, like they, they, they told me that um, simply they, um, I think there were mixed feelings in that. On one component was probably in their heart, they didn't believe that what I was going to do was possible. 
Obviously. They thought it would fail. Yeah, most probably. And secondly, also that you know the the, um, the level of um, engagement capabilities uh, that uh, um, I would have expect uh, for this job were um, were not in their set of skills. Let's say. Um, but uh, you know, the, I think that the most important thing to say here is that as a message is that. You know, you cannot be only naive, so if you embrace uh, such a big, big change, you need to be equipped for that. And that's probably my fourth bullet point of what we did, which is, you know, you need to set up your organization, your staff, your business partner in a way that, uh, you know, they can help you, because uh, this is not a one-man show, uh, and, and you need the people to, to follow you. And Japan has got plenty of those people. Uh, so my staff today is here, most of them, 90% of them, uh, they are all Japanese. So, you know, I didn't have to go and hire uh, French or Italians or American. I actually hired one Italian, but he's more Japanese than Italian, as my, my colleagues always say. Um, uh, but they shared the vision with me. I mean, they share this um, uh, entrepreneurial spirit, they are risk-taking. Uh, they laugh at me in a, in a positive way when, uh, when I go into meetings with my millions of new ideas and you know, they don't run away, but actually they, they start to get organized on how to, you know, to go after those ideas. And of course we fail, you know, every day we have good news and bad news. Uh, but suddenly, you know, Japan looks like any other place I've worked in. Uh, you know, things happen. Uh, they are actually quite fast. Uh, uh, think can, things can change. Um, it's, it's just it's, it's just Japan. I mean, it's beautiful uh, because it's it's different, but the business works like in any other country. You know, I'm I'm starting to sense a theme, a recurring theme here. Um, that first of all, there's no reason why Japan should be any different from any other market where you are successful in the world, which is in most markets, um, and that uh, there is no reason that you cannot find uh, Japanese staff who are growth-oriented, willing to take reasonable business risk, willing to um, have an entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, there's no reason that, that those characteristics are somehow not present among the Japanese. They are. And so the staff that quit maybe did not have that. Mm -hmm. But the ones that you hired did. They hide, you know, it's not easy to find them. I, I, it took some months to, uh, to go and find them. But, um, but that's hard in any country, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I mean, talented people uh, are, um, are not, of course, the majority of people. But, uh, uh, but I don't think that you can build a business in Japan uh, uh, living in a in a crystal ball and and thinking that the uh, um, you can run the country from I from Italy or you can run the business from Singapore sure. uh, and uh, and this is uh, we, we didn't touch that point but you know many of us work for big corporation that was the second biggest challenge I had you know that was all the back office work I had to do to to convince my entire management on what needed to be done in Japan and how to deal with the change in Japan and and which were the challenges here and I still work very hard uh, on that every day but I can also share a story on that which I think is uh, it's interesting I don't know how can resonate with you but I knew, you know, uh, um, my chickens, we say in Italy, I don't know if it's, uh, we say also in English, so I know that we have problems in the back house to get people on board. So the first thing I did was creating a, a support team, multifunctional, multi-country team, uh, leveraging on the expertise of headquarters. Uh, you know, we are Italians, we like to do things together, so I had to, you know, bring people on board. Um, so th th this is a transition as you were transitioning That was during the transition, yes. Actually, it was funny because uh, 35 years in Japan as Barilla, but only 20 years ago, exactly 20 years ago, we created the first office. Mm -hmm. I learned that 20 is the coming of the age in Japan, and it said, uh, it translates into Hatachi, if I'm not wrong, or at least what my team sold to me. And so we created this Atachi team, uh, uh, cross-functional, cross-based uh, through you know, Italy, Singapore, Dubai, 
through supply chain, finance, legal, etc. So I mean, it was a little bit busy because I had all these, you know, people visiting Japan very often. But it created a sense of common, um, common vision in the entire organization, uh, and I created a lot of. Um, followers, let's say, in digital uh, way, uh, that started to understand Japan, and they became my ambassador through the functions. Um, and, uh, and that made everything and much th easier. these are followers who are part of Barilla's worldwide of course, yes. organization. So you were, you were leveraging expertise uh, from Barilla worldwide uh, to shore up what you needed uh, in Japan as some staff quit, yep. um, and, uh, and other staff, uh, did you have to lay off? Um, yes, of course we manage this. Uh, I think uh, you know that's another point. You know, when I came here and I spoke to local legals or uh, or a few consultants, everybody told me you know it's impossible to you know to 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 change stuff here in Japan. You know, it's which, which is absolutely not true. Right. I don't know if it's uh, well. In my case, in our case, was not true. But but I have again to install the component of uh, of Barilla because you know we just we just didn't go to the people and say you know thank you very much for your 20 years work in Barilla bye uh, we did in a, in a very personal uh, individual way and uh, and also you know um, uh, taking any possible care uh, of uh, of our staff so it resulted in a smooth uh, changeover with no no big consequences so 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 basically you you knew you, you had to move people out of the organization. Uh, you recognized your responsibility in having hired them in the first place and in deciding to make the changes. And so you made it as um, humane as possible sure. and looking after them. And, and that's consistent with the family values of Barilla, is it not? <coughs> Yeah, to the point that you know, uh, f with many of some of them, we'll of course we are in touch. But with many of them that actually got uh, um, re uh, reassigned or relocated into into the same industry, we still work together. And uh, mm -hmm. and I don't think that they 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 have any bad feeling about the company. And uh, we are still in touch. We even share uh, opinions on uh, on on what we are doing. Uh, so, so they moved in, into other companies where they're, they're just a better fit, works for them better. Exactly. I don't think it's a matter of being good or bad. I think it's a every one of us has a set of skills and capabilities that could serve better or less uh, appropriately to a certain context. And uh, in our context, uh, it was nothing about the people. It was actually about the capabilities we needed. And uh, if I think to the company three years ago, we were a rep office basically doing uh, business entertainment and uh, uh, logistic matters. Now we are a, a typical FMCG company represented with all the uh, key functions. So at the time, I didn't need a marketing director. I didn't need a, a, a sales director in proper sense of uh, you know going out and selling our product. Um, so it was nothing about people, it was about capabilities and, and I think that this is a quite fair discussion that, like I was saying, for the business you can have in Japan because business is business. Um, Altogether, all uh, how, how many people left the company and how many people stayed? No, we are very small, so I mean, I'm not telling a a gigantic story here probably for us to make all this change was also a little bit simpler because we are a small organization but we're talking um, less than 10 people uh, getting out and uh, the same amount coming in who, who stayed uh, i think you know um again i mean it was nothing personal uh, the people that stayed in the organization uh, i mean i can counterpart I can say the other episode so as as much as two people came to my office the day after saying you know I'm sorry Anthony I cannot help you I have to go I had two people coming into my office you know kind of you know they they were bright you know there was a light around them saying you know finally I'm with you you know what I have to do tomorrow morning you know I was waiting for this day since I joined Barilla actually some of them told me that they were joined to do what I was trying to do, <laughs> and for 10 years didn't happen. So those people stayed that's, in That's uh, very patient. Yeah. 
<laughs> that's Japan again. <laughs> so those people stayed. They are uh, they are with us, and I think they 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 fit in the in the new organization. Um, and I you know we do every six months, so one year, you know, performance review, but, and I get from them positive feedback saying, you know, finally I'm doing what, what I want to do and uh, yeah. I'm selling products if I'm a salesperson and I'm going after new business because I'm a salesperson. So, so none of what, um, none of the disaster that, that some of your staff had been predicting ever came to pass, is that correct? 90% yes, of course some disasters happen, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, you, uh, the, um, the vision uh, that my former partner had represent a vision of a part of the Japan um, business environment, so uh, we lost on the ground some of, um, of our clients, of course, or customers. Um, then within this group I can say, you know, there was half of group, half of these that we we lost uh, s simply because uh, I was not true to myself, but then I will uh, dig a little bit more into that. And some customer that probably, I don't know, we will never regain because they belong too much to, um, to a certain set of values that are not our values anymore. Uh, but yes, I mean, to answer your question on broader terms, no, it was not a big disaster. Of course, planning re is, is a key element of, of, uh, of a business transformation. So part of our planning was to set up also, you know, from the start, new route, to, you know, new customers, new channels, new route to markets, um, tabling uh, conversations with the distributors on how to run the business uh, as of day one. Um, so net net, the loss were more than compensated by the uh, uh, by the gains and um, we we are coming now through this year of transformation in a double digit growth with a profitable business so so far so good i would say so so there there were maybe some some losses but by by clearing all this out uh you were able to make room for growth in the direction that you wanted to take the business what what does your business look like now um, a normal business. <laughs> a normal business, okay. <laughs> a very normal business uh, of... Uh, a oh, I'd say double-digit growth is exceptional, not necessarily normal. I think we are regaining, uh, you know, what we left a little bit on the ground in the past years. But what we have now is, uh, is a small team, 10 people motivated to, to uh, and that share common values of growing the company. We are surrounded by um, clients, customers, suppliers uh, that share most of our values um, and um, and we simply sell what we have to sell with no uh, you know with no shame or no problems I mean we go to the customer and we say look you know for us it's not just about selling pasta uh, it's about selling uh, Italian lifestyle, it's about selling gastronomy, and by the way, pasta is not only spaghetti, you know, and, um, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, of course, we, st we still have big, big challenges in, in selling some of our concepts. I mean, we are a company that has ex is extremely focused on uh, sustainability. Uh, so, you know, I don't want to go in details, but of course when in Japan you have to sell pasta wrapped into plastic bags that go into a box, which is consequentially wrapped into a plastic fold that goes into a carton box, uh, double layer resistant, this goes a little bit against our sustainability policies. Uh, but we try to do that, you know, I right. think it's a, a responsibility of our entity, economical entity, to work with the Japanese customers and clients and try to express our values uh, 360. So it's work in progress, like with Absolutely, I mean we have- uh, you have a staff that can help you do it. 30, 40 years ahead of us of work in progress. Now, before I open up, <laughs> I, I hope it's not that long, <laughs> but before, before I open up uh, the, the floor to questions, I, I just wanna ask you one final question, because I, I know that we have a lot of uh, Barilla staff here in the audience, and I, I really hope that they are not spooked by all of this discussion of the, the past, and I doubt that they are. 
Um, but uh, let me ask you, when, when you're looking at people to join your business, what would you say the most important capability or, or two capabilities would be um, that you'd be looking for in those people? Um, they have to be entrepreneur um, and they have to challenge the system. Uh, but for me, entrepreneur is obvious. For me, entrepreneurship means that, you know, no matter if you are a secretary or you are a sales director, uh, there is always a way that you can bring something into your job and make it better for the company. Uh, and I also believe that while you're doing this, you feel better and everything works much better. Um, challenging the status quo is not easy because I don't want just people that challenge the status quo for the sake of it. Uh, they have to be smart enough to bring, to leverage on their capabilities and understand every time in every single situation how much they can challenge the situation. Uh, but for sure I, my, my parameter for success is every incremental step that we do towards the status quo. Now I, I work with a lot of CEOs and they talk about the types of people that they're looking for for their organization and it's very similar to what Anthony just described. Um, and based on what you're saying these people are out there. You can find them if you're looking for them and if you stick to your values. So with that, um, I'd like to open up the floor to questions. Hi, I'm Carl Hanahef of Japan. We're also an importer and distributor, so I understand a lot of your challenges. You said that you went from an um, importer and exclusive distributor relationship. Can you go in more detail about uh, the type of setup you have now, whether it's multiple distributors or you have direct access? And what's the share of that, maybe? And then the secondary question is the upcoming European trade agreement. Is that going to have any impact on your business, and if so, what? Yes, thank you very much. Um, our model now is uh, simply um, reflecting what the market needs. So again, I, we didn't create a model because we, we want to run the business in a certain way in Japan. We are adapting to what the market wants. What the market wants is that we, we need to deal directly with some customers. Uh, because you know we have global customers, we have global contracts, you are very familiar with this structure, so I cannot avoid dealing with uh, Costco, with Walmart, with you know big uh, international guys because we deal with them everywhere in the world. Uh, but at the same time, we have to deal with uh, demands and the service level in the countries that we will never be able to, uh, to cope with. So we work with many distributors. Um, at the moment, our business is probably 20% direct only, and the rest is through distributors. Uh, and I see this lasting for you know forever, most likely, because we will never be able to uh, to cover this level of services and activities we want. Um, to the second question, I mean that that's extremely interesting. Um, the problem is that they have not set any KPI for when and how this is going to happen. But for our industry, and I think for food, Italian food or European food in general, is going to be disruptive. Um, you know, now our, in terms of price, we almost already compete with the Japanese producer. The day that we will not have any more custom duties or uh, extra costs, that will be extremely interesting to see what happens in this market. And I look forward for that, not only for the business growth we have ahead of us, but for the changes that it will necessarily bring into the Japanese structure. And once again, that has nothing to do with the importer, producer, manufacturer relation with the distributor. Um, one of the um, point of, I think it's working now, is that the relation we have with our uh, distribu main distributor or distributors is that we adapt the model to, to the customer need. So sometimes it's the old fashioned model, exactly the same. In other occasion is a more just, you know, a supply delivery model or in other occasion is a more execution model, and we're looking for partners that can adapt to this model. Thank you. Other questions? In the back. Uh, 
Um, thank you very much, Anthony, um, for the presentation. Um, Tsai John Muller from Georgia, Japan. I have two questions as well. Just speak up a little bit louder, please. Yeah, sure. Okay. The first question is, uh, you mentioned uh, when after your meeting with uh, the previous importer and the CEO, you decided to change um, your model. So now you're working, I understand, um, with another food giant uh, at the trading house. So, and then you, you, said, you mentioned that you're looking for transparent and honest uh, relationship partnership. So how do we ensure going forward that this another Japanese traditional trading house food giant will not you know, it will not be a déjà vu. And the second question is more personal, because foreign executives here uh, um, often get this question, do you like natto? Since we're in the pasta world, I wanted to ask you, do you like udon? Because it's not al dente at all. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you. The, um, I don't think it's going to, hopefully, it's not going to end like um, with a déjà vu. Um, and the reason why we ended up having as a major partner one of the big Japanese corporation is because they could provide to us this variety and flexibility of services. It's not a secret I can share this with you. I mean, you, you are mentioning that. So one of our preferred partners at the moment is Mitsubishi Corporation, let's say. Uh, the flexibility we have asked into this model is that in some of our business interaction, their uh, dis food distributor, for example, is not involved, but the Mitsubishi logistic is involved. Or, uh, if, uh, or if I need uh, a manufacturing support, there are no companies involved, or maybe Mitsubishi food is involved for the distribution, but I have also a relation with manufactured or ingredient suppliers at the, at the back, uh, back end. So that's, that's, I think it's a very reasonable potentially long-lasting type of, uh, of partnership. Uh, of course, it's tricky. I don't want to you know, um, uh, deny that it might create some problems with other big corporation companies. But once again, you know, I tend to, to stick to my, again, you know, naive vision, which is, for me, there is room to work with the Itochu Corporation or with Mitsui Corporation, because we can find the same type of agreement or we can find a balance in the services that we acquire through the value chain of selling our products. Then if the counterpart don't want to deal with us for a matter of principle because we deal with the other guys, then uh, I mean, it's, it's, uh, we will try to do without, I don't know. But Anthony, if we go back to root cause for the, the problem with the original distributor, it was ultimately you know, low performance and um, <clears throat> Uh, just completely uh, a complete disagreement on where you both wanted to go with the business. Now, with the ones with the the companies that you're working with now, uh, are you what what are you doing to make sure that you don't run into the problem where your visions are are going off in different directions? Two basic things: uh, we have uh, open book philosophy, uh, both sides. So. Totally transparent philosophy. So finally, I know how much I sell, to how much, to every single customer. So that's transparency, and they know our uh, structural cost. They know our investments. So transparency, transparency is first and is foremost the first, of the, deal. Uh, the first thing. And second is sharing a common vision. Of course, I would have not married. Uh, a new partner if uh, they, they couldn't, they didn't believe that, you know, pasta or barilla company could be 10 times bigger than it is now. Right. Uh, at minimum, uh, I would say, because 10 times bigger would be only my ambition for pasta. Then I have the other 50% of the company to bring in Japan. <laughs> uh, plus what I have in mind, which are other things, categories, etc. And to your second question, um, I, I think that uh, pasta belongs to the family of um, staple food. So I don't see udon as a, an enemy, I see udon as an opportunity because my dream would be that a Japanese family, like an American family or an Italian family, would have in their, uh, in their set of uh, food uh, in their pantry, udon, soba, noodles, ramen, pasta and that maybe they could alternate the frequency of consumption of those products from time to time. And honestly, I mean, I eat udon every week, I eat soba every week, and, um, and I like the difference. 
I like the one uh, that is soft because that day I like something soft uh, going in a soup or uh, the other day I like the al dente mm -hmm. of, uh, of pasta. Uh, I think that's one of the beauty of, uh, uh, you know, globalization in a sense. And, um, and you know, we don't believe in uh, uh, the planet eating only Italian food. <laughs> uh, we believe in the planet having a very balanced diet uh, which has pasta uh, sometimes from time to time uh, um, and that's that's it funny story though is that pasta and udon are exactly the opposite and com, you know kind of balancing each other because udon is very soft correct but it actually you find something at the end which is chewy and thick a little bit i love that Pasta, you have just to expect, you know, your brain has to expect the opposite. So you will have the al dente crunchiness feeling in the beginning and then the softness inside. So, so I think completely complementary. Yeah. I've never tried uh, spaghetti into an udon soup or vice versa. Uh, <laughs> but what I can tell you, for example, is that maybe many of you have been in Hong Kong or lived there. But the typical Hong Kong breakfast is a pasta soup, uh, elbow, or in chicken soup. So that's a very typical uh, breakfast. Totally fine to me. Is uh, you know, <laughs> the more pasta we sell, the better it is. Other questions? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> my name is Kango from a company called Enroll. Uh, thanks for your speech. Um, I am a Japanese person, and I've been in this Japanese culture. And referring to what you say, you're not just only trying to provide the pasta, but also for a uh, Italian life. Now, I, I, my question is, how do you vision uh, the Japanese people, Japanese culture, um, embracing the Italian life like? If there are any layers or if there are any area that you're seeing that, okay, how Japanese people are embracing Italian life is looking like that. If you have any mind in, in, in your you know, idea, I'd appreciate to be, you know, I appreciate to hear that. Now bear in mind, we have limited time. <laughs> yeah, and it's a very difficult question. I never thought in such a broader terms. Um, but let me start from the things I know. Um, I don't know what, I'm curious to have your answer on that, but if I say how much different you think Japanese culture and Italian culture are, more or less will be what for you? It's like what we share, 10%, 20%, 100%? Um, in regards to pasta. No, no, to culture. You were talking lifestyle, right? Culture. Quite different, I think. Quite different. So maybe we share only a 10%. <laughs> I agree with that. I think that we share 80%. 90. 80. And, 80. and why? 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 Because you don't like soccer uh, as we do, so that's 10%. <laughs> um, you like baseball, so it's, it's very different, so that makes 10%. Um, no, I think we share many, many things. I think we share the sense of beauty. I mean, Japan after, not after, Japan with Italy, I think, are the countries that have the best beauty expression 360, we, we share the family values, we share um, uh, the cultural roots, you know. Uh, we were talking before, my distributor, etc., about the hierarchical thing. I say this with great respect, I'm not, uh, uh, if, you go, if you were in Italy 20 years ago, and they, again, I'm saying this with respect, I'm not saying that Japan is 20 years later. Uh, it, it, 20 years ago, Italy was 100% Japan, excluding baseball. Um, because you know we would we we have three languages as well as you have. We have a very casual language, a super f a formal language, and a very formal language. And when you would go into an office, you would speak the super formal language, like we do in Japan, or you do. I my Japanese is zero. Um, uh, the the hierarchy thing. I mean, all our structures, business, family friends, they were all hierarchical, okay, exactly the same. Then the Americans came in in the last 20 years, now we are all friends. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're welcome. And it's beautiful now, it's much better. Um, and so many things. So I really think that we share millions of things. Food, you know, of course you eat Japanese food, we eat Italian food, but the, uh, the, the, um, the essence of food, the, the interest about food, the uh, engagement that people have with food, it's only similar to the Italians. Well, what about the regionality of food? I was getting there. Ah. I was getting there. You know, your food changed every 
15, 20 kilometers. In Italy, maybe it's every 10, even more. Uh, and not, not by chance, you know, many of our municipalities, and I was talking before with, uh, with you, uh, they actually have already partnership with Italy. So you have a city that is, you know, a twin city with another town in Italy. So we share a lot of things. Um, that's why Japanese are very frequent uh, tourists to Italy and vice versa. I went to Kanazawa for a forum uh, last week and I discovered that uh, uh, the number one uh, foreigners in Kanazawa are Italians. Big surprise. Um, so I think that Italian life. The number one, say that again, the number one foreigners. For its community of, in Kanazawa is Italians. And, and why is that? The view of the, um, of the local uh, government is that uh, since they opened the Shinkansen, the connection is easier with uh, Tokyo. And uh, mm -hmm. la, la. I think that we Italians go because it's a beautiful city by the sea. And again, we find many commonalities. So Italians will travel uh, 100 miles to go and eat a specific food. So they come to Tokyo, they hear that Tsukiji market is too busy, it's a mess, and that uh, Kanazawa fish market is as beautiful, they will go. And uh, so we are not surprised that Japanese come to Italy and in one week they do seven cities, which is mathematically, uh, technically impossible, but we are not surprised. That's exactly what we do when we come to Tokyo. So we go to Tokyo, Nagoya, Kyoto, Osaka and, uh, in seven days. So I think there is a great opportunity for all uh, Italian companies or, uh, or uh, uh, lifestyle dealers, so, you know, ja fashion industry. I have many friends, you know, of the top uh, fashion uh, companies, and I'm surprised by the fact that their number one country is Japan. It's not Italy, it's not the US. Bulgari number one country is Japan, Prada number one country is Japan. So there must be something in that. So I cannot say that it's only 10% of commonalities between Italian and Japanese. So uh, we're, we're going to have to wrap this up, but I'll, I will say that there's this recurring theme that you are finding far more commonality between uh, Japan and the rest of the world and Italy uh, than difference. And you've built on that. You've built a successful business on that. Yet there are differences that you have to respect. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, but again, I think this is a, a basic human behavior and human well behavior. You would expect someone to come to Italy to respect a little bit the, the local sense, right? And that's what you have to do in, uh, in, in Japan as well. Well, it sounds like you've done that with resounding success. Um, I would like to thank uh, Anthony Strianese for, for sharing his wisdom.